that you'll enjoy. So the history from the forward of the second edition. All right, now something's screwed up here. Give me one second, folks. I gotta just do a little housekeeping. There we go. All right. The second edition Big Book was released at the AA International held in St. Louis, July 2nd through the, I think the second through the fifth on here, we got second and third, but it was longer than that. Actually, they had the delegates come in early for this convention because Bill had introduced a general service structure and they had been doing the general service conference as a trial for several years then they brought it uh, to st louis and invited all of the delegates that were past and present to attend they brought them in early and this whole convention theme was aa comes of age so this is how it happened by bringing all the delegates everybody there and one of the things that they were going to introduce was the second edition big book. Now it's interesting that the, the second edition came out when it first came out, it had this band on it that you can see uh, here on the left side of your screen. The book featured a white band, okay? And on the band, it kind of said, you know, new and revised, the big, everything was huge about this. Everything having to do with this conference, it's 1955, AA comes of age. This was actually one of the, the most incredible historic times of AA ever had. The convention and everything that led up to it, the book, the delegates, the service structure, of uh, AA comes of age, the writing of that afterwards, the non-alcoholics that participated in the conference, they loaded this conference up with just incredible, you know, we look back on it today and go, oh my God, it all happened in St. Louis at the 1955 International. So this book was featured and it came out and this was what they were giving away to the, part, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, guests at the International. New and revised, the big book, pages one through 164 remain unchanged, but the personal history section has 33 new stories, totally 110,398 words. You can see just by putting the band on it that they were into promoting this book. Now it's really interesting on the very first printing of this book, okay, with the band. There was also a paragraph, and, and, and if you look at the inside of the dust jacket, they wasted no space, okay? When they came out with this book, the dust jacket was loaded with the information. Everything they did was very well thought out and planned and carefully executed so that they could transition to the second edition and have, so the reversible, this is, this is part of it. I'm going to go back here. So down at the bottom, if you look at the right-hand side and you see, I'm going to put my, I don't know if you can see, there's a third paragraph at the bottom above Alcoholics Anonymous Publishing. This paragraph was only present on the first run, first printing. So only the books that were printed and given away at St. Louis that had the original band also had this statement in it. And the statement reads, this book may be ordered from the publisher upon free examination basis, examined for seven days, and if not satisfied that the book will be helpful, return and money, including postage, will be refunded. That was inside the first printing, first issue, second edition, 1955, that was given away everything was so carefully laid out with this publication and how they promoted it, including, see the traditions when the first edition came out, the traditions had not yet come to play. 
So the traditions were started to be written in 1946, even though Bill had done some things previous to that, because if you look at the forward to the first edition, you can see that a lot of the, the traditions were already in the works as early as 1939. However, the, the, the forward to the first edition, okay, um, and the and the the content of the first edition, they weren't they weren't thinking. Even though they mentioned in the forward to the first edition that we were, they asked the fellowship to remain anonymous when speaking and only identify themselves as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But the whole anonymity, and here we are in St. Louis in 1955, and AA is growing, and there's groups starting all over, and the international, and people are coming in from other countries and all over the United States, and the delegates are all there, and everybody's there, and they're they're going to be talking traditions, but the traditions were adopted at the 50 international, so we had them. But with the with the introduction of the dust jacket, it, they they made it reversible, so that if you wanted to read the book and keep it and not keep yourself anonymous while you're out in public, you just reverse the dust jacket. They thought of everything with this book, new front matter. So they included a preface. They also included the forward to their first edition and then the forward to the second edition. Okay. Now, if you look at the forward, the first edition, the one in the center there, you'll read that it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are many thousands of men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Well, in fact, the forward to the first edition read, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show the alcoholics how we how precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So in the first printing of the second edition, they included the forwards of the first edition, but they changed it. I found that kind of interesting. And what else is interesting is later on, they did 16 printings of the second edition, and later on they added they changed it back to the way it originally was. I think that was in the, like the 11th or 12th printing of the second edition. They changed it back to 100 men and women. I thought that was interesting. So the preface, there was no preface prior to this. And I'm just going to read this only because I want you to see that when they came out with a second edition, they were docked history for us. They were giving us a glimpse at what they had already um, had to live with. This is the second edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which made its first appearance in April of 1939. More than 300,000 copies of the first edition are now in circulation. Well, I thought that that historically, I think it's kind of cool that they added them all up and let us know that, you know, there were 300,000 copies already before they came out with this. Because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recover, there exists a sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. Therefore, the first portion of this volume describing the AA program has been left largely untouched. I like, that, I, I like the fact that he didn't say completely untouched. But the personal history section has been considerably revised and enlarged in order to present a more accurate, repre accurate representation of our membership as it is today. When the book was first printed, we had scarcely 100 members, all told. And every one of them, was an almost hopeless case of alcoholism. This has changed AA now. AA now helps alcoholics in all stages of the disease. It reaches into every level of life and into nearly all occupations. Our membership now includes many young people, women who were first very reluctant to approach AA and have <clears throat> come forward in large numbers. Therefore, the range of story section has been broadened 
so that the alcoholic reader may find a reflection of himself or herself in it. As a souvenir of our past, the original forward has been preserved as followed and, and is followed by the second one describing Alcoholics Anonymous as 1955. Following the forewords, there appears a section called <clears throat> The Doctor's Opinion. This also has been kept intact as it was originally published and written in 1939 by the late Dr. William D. Silkworth, our society's great medical benefactor. Besides Dr. Silkworth's original statement, there have been added in the appendices a number of medical and religious endorsements which have come to us in recent years. On the last pages of the second edition will be found the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, the principles upon which our AA groups function together with directions for getting in touch with AA. You know, they put so much information in just a few pages of this book to help us have a better understanding of what was happening in AA, but also for our culture to understand how AA had grown and what was happening in it. The, the forward to the first edition, I've just gone through that, so I'm gonna skip this section. The forward to the second edition, since the original forward of the book was written 19, so this is just going through what I just did. All right. Oh, I see. So Tim worked very hard to get this thing set up for me. And basically what we've tried to do is, is give you the history as Bill was outlining it in the forward. So here, the growth of a, a Alcoholics Anonymous mushroomed into six, nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered alcoholics. Also, all told promising beginnings have been made in some 50 foreign countries in US possessions. I mean, it's amazing how AA had grown then and what it's like now. The spark that flared in the first AA group was struck in Akron in June of 1935 during a talk between a New York stockbroker and an Akron physician we know as Dr. Bob and Bill W. Six months earlier, Bill had gotten sober and uh, had a sudden, amazing, transforming spiritual experience. And he wanted to try to share that experience with others and found that they had to have it in another way. Not everybody was going to have that and recognize the sudden experience that maybe later they could come back and they could look at it or they could have what we uh, then were referring to and Bill was referring to as the educational variety. So that had changed a lot from 39 to 55. Uh, William D. Silkworth, Bill had also been greatly helped by, by Silkworth. And, uh, and Silkworth helped a lot of early alcoholics. And he went on and started an alcoholic ward after he left town ho Towns Hospital at, at Nickenbacher Hospital in New York. And there was a lady that worked with him, Nurse Teddy. I think I've mentioned this on other, uh, other evenings, but Nurse Teddy, they did an article about her in the Saturday Evening Post. And it's called, I'm a nurse in an alcoholic ward. And we also have Nurse Teddy's uh, AA talk on our website. You might want to check that out if you haven't already. And, you know, Bill went to see Bob. And as a result of it, you know, they, they began to work with other alcoholics. And AA number three story is in the second edition. And it was not in the first edition. And Bill Dotson got sober in June of 1935. And, uh, and started out with Bill and Dr. Bob, and they became the first group, and they worked together, and they they learned the principles together, and they nurtured it. And uh, it's interesting that Bill Dotson didn't have his story in the first edition big book. He uh, he and other other AA members in and around the Akron, Cleveland area were still trying to figure this thing out. They didn't know if this was a New York thing where they were going to try to make a bunch of money on it. And some of these guys were feeling maybe they shouldn't mix money with spirituality. And perhaps that 
perhaps that endorsing this or putting their story up might do that. Bill Dotson, I don't know what his feelings were initially, but I know later he conceded to allow Bill Wilson to write his story. So Bill recorded him, they interviewed him, and Bill Wilson wrote the story that's in the second edition big book for AA number three, Bill Dotson, authored by Bill Wilson. So by late 37, the number of members substantial sobriety time convinced them that they needed to do the book, okay? And it, here, just in a highlight, the fledgling society, which became, which was nameless, now began to call themselves Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of the book, okay? This is in the forward to the first edition, okay? Now it's interesting, okay, that we can look at the history and we can look at the first printing of the first edition. We can see how things came and we know that, that they had the fellowship already. They had the book and they, they wanted to, you know, Bill over and over and over said, what we have is a nameless society. They didn't have the steps until earlier that year. So it wasn't something that, that they had the program. What they had was principles that they had adopted by attending some of the Oxford group meetings in New York and in Akron. Bill Wilson, when he went to introduce Dr. Bob to the concept of those two getting sober together and helping others, as he had been trying to do in New York, it, was, it wasn't long after that that they identified they had to have a book, but initially, Ann Smith was teaching them ideas from the Bible. They were sitting at the in 855 Ardmore Avenue by the gas fireplace, and Ann Smith was reading to them from the Bible, and they were talking about it. Dr. Bob and Bill spent hours every day talking about how they could work with and help other alcoholics. They were able to come up with that the alcoholic had to be deflated. They knew that from their experience with each other. They knew that that alcoholic had to have some belief in some power greater than themselves. And that was what was being formulated in, in 855 Ardmore with Ann and Bob and, 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 and Bill and those that were starting to come in because they were nurturing these principles from the Oxford group and the deflation and then and then the acceptance and belief in some kind of power greater than themselves. And then a inventory, writing down what, what they had done, kind of a life story, but the people they hurt. And then having a confession with someone that was the next thing they did. And then after that, they knew they had to pay restitution to the people that they hurt. So they began to put together how they could go do that and make amends to people. And then, of course, the last thing was they knew they couldn't keep it to themselves. They can't keep their light under a basket. They need to share this. And Bill soon realized he needed to share this so he could stay sober himself. And I find that kind of interesting. So when we talk about the program being unnamed and not having steps and not having a book, that's exactly where they were at. So were they doing it exactly the same by 1937 in Philadelphia and Cleveland, the same as they were doing in Akron and New York? Well, as things were growing, they began to see that they had to unify it. So the book was important. So as the book was beginning to, to get some popularity and AA was beginning to prove that it could work and people were staying sober, they were having opportunities to receive some press. And, and this was the first national publication that was done. It was actually done two weeks earlier than this by accident in Canada. Uh, the same magazine was, was uh, September 16th. The article Alcoholics and God was first printed and made available in Canada in the uh, September 16th of 1939. And then on September 30th of 1939, this came out in the United States, the Liberty 
magazine article. Interesting that the article did really well. Bill and the people in New York were excited about it. the 800 frantic inquiries is what he, what he put in. Now, if you read the forward to the second edition, this is what this is where the information is coming from that I'm sharing with you here. And it's really interesting that 800 frantic. So they were looking at this as, as a success but they were also looking at it as a failure. Hank Parkhurst was still at Alcoholics Anonymous by this time, and the book had come out, things were coming, but it wasn't moving very fast. It was very, very slow. They had done a, uh, a little thing with uh, Gabriel Heater, and uh, they had a guy on the Gabriel Heater radio program. Um, his name was Morgan Ryan. And Morgan was, they expect, they sent cards out to medical doctors. They used uh, all the money they had. And then they had Morgan on there and they thought they were going to start selling big books by the truckload. They didn't. I think Bill said that he and Hank went to the mailbox and they and they checked and they looked in the mailbox. You know, the old post-its boxes used to have a little window on it. And you look in the window and he said, they looked in the window and they could see there were five cards that were responded five and bill looked at hank and hank looked at bill and hank said bill they must have bags of them in the back they couldn't put them all in here well they didn't have bags of them in the back and probably a darn good thing that they didn't because had alcoholics anonymous had the inquiries at this state of the game they did not have enough of a structure of membership to handle the inquiries. So what happened, because they didn't get those, they had just enough people coming to AA that they could, from Akron, you had Chicago, and you had Detroit, and you had Indianapolis, and then it spread to Oklahoma. And from there, the guy that started in Oklahoma took it over to Kansas City. And in New York, you had New Jersey going, you had Philadelphia going, you had Washington, D.C. going. So all of this activity is going on, okay? And, uh, and AA is growing, but it was slow. It was painfully slow. So AA was sending out things like this publication in front of you to try to encourage and boost book sales. They were sending pamphlets out to the groups and charging them a nickel and just, just trying to get the information out about the book that had come out so more and more people would get this. The Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, did a series of articles in October 1939. So they came out just after the Liberty Magazine articles and Cleveland got the phone ringing. Those articles got the phone ringing in New York. So all of a sudden Cleveland's getting inundated with all of these calls that were coming through New York and Ruth Hawk is sending letters to Clarence and different members in Cleveland. Clarence is setting up classes and teaching newly sobered people how to go out on 12 step calls and how to sponsor these new pigeons that he had. So we had a lot of action going on in Cleveland. There was a lot of activity going on in Akron with Dr. Bob and Ann and the folks that they were helping. And Lois and Bill were sleeping in New York those guys were going crazy trying to get the book done and helping new guys and working at Towns Hospital there was a lot of action that you know the message I'm trying to say today is AA grew like this not by accident these people were taking action it didn't grow the way they wanted it to that didn't happen till later and, you know, so now the book and everything and, and Rockefeller helps to cure alcoholics. You know, they, he did the Rockefeller dinner to try to raise some money and that helped. It didn't raise a tremendous amount of money, but it gave Bill a little bit of clout and a little bit of help there. But when the Saturday Evening Post article hit in March of 1941, all I can say as a historian is thank God that everything didn't work as good as Hank and Bill wanted it to because had those other magazines and had the, the things that they had tried, the, the promotions to the medical pro, uh, professionals and the Gabriel Heater and all of that worked and poor Ruth Hawk would have gotten all those inquiries 
there was nobody to answer him. There was nobody that she could have sent those cards to. But by March of 1941, she had about 2,000 people in AA. From 1935 to 19, till 1941, we put together about 2,000 people. So by the time the Jack Alexander article hit, we had people all over the country, East Coast and West Coast, that could go on those cards and those calls and those 12-step calls that needed to take place as a result of the Saturday Evening Post article. And AA grew from 2,000 to 8,000 in one year. You know, and the traditions that had come out in uh, uh, 46, and here, you know, Bill wanted to talk about the traditions. He wanted to make sure that they were included in the second edition. You know, they, they, they were still new. He wanted people to understand. He was still selling the traditions. He was still selling the general service concept. He was still selling AA needs to be of itself, not a Bill Wilson thing. As we have discovered the principles by which the individual alcoholic could live, so we had to evolve principles by which AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. This was the substance of AA's 12th tradition, which are stated in full on page 564 of this book. Though none of these principles had the force of rules or laws, they had become so widely accepted by 1950 that they were confirmed at our first international <clears throat> conference held in Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. Wow. Yeah, I think if Bill Wilson could, could join us on Zoom today, we might catch him quoting that today, the most remarkable, today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of our greatest assets that our society has. Without that first tradition, we have no unity, we have no recovery. Recovery percentage even went there in the second edition of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried. 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses. And among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program, but great numbers of these, about two thirds, about two out of three began to return as time passed. Again, very interesting. I have uh, read, I have a, pamphlet where Bill was talking to medical societies and in there he actually said that this okay 50 percent of those who come in and really try what he did is he said he said half of the people that come to AA just check it out and leave that's it then he said of those who stay and really try 50 percent of those get sober at once. I found that kind of interesting. So the personal stories in the second edition, I'll make sure we cover those. For those of you uh, that don't have a second edition, you can let the second editions are available online anywhere from, you know, on eBay, I see them from $35 to three, four hundred dollars if you get, you know, an early printing in, in a jacket. Okay. Well, we got Dr. Bob's story, AA number three, written by Bill W. He had to be shown. <clears throat> he thought he could drink like a gentleman. Women suffer too. The European drinker, the vicious cycle, which is Jim Burwell's story, which was added in the second edition. The news hawk. From Farm to City, The Man Who Mastered Fear, previously named The Fearless One. He sold himself short, home brewmeister, keys to the kingdom. Yeah, I said earlier when we were just talking that my favorite, my favorite story that was added in the 
second edition was <clears throat> written by John P. And it's called The Professor and the Paradox. And here's just a couple of minutes of John giving a talk. We learn in Alcoholics Anonymous groups to eliminate alcoholism by doing things which strike at the deep-seated causes of the malady. Not by just taking the whiskey away or passing a law or whatever else. We learn in AA to change our self-centeredness. To stop running away from things we don't like. To remove or at least adjust our personal shortcomings. We do these things by taking seriously and honestly our 12 steps. The nearest thing to a cure for alcoholism that anyone has discovered yet. We learn in AA that uh, these steps over a sufficient period of time will change our attitudes, will change our thinking, will change our personalities, if that be possible. Certainly it will change the inner man or woman into something it had not been before. And it will change our pattern of living in the one we have not enjoyed in the past. Now, we learn to do these things not by just memorizing these steps, though I've always thought that was a good idea, but rather by attempting to live and act them each day of our lives. And then when we least expect it, we discover that as a result of all this, we are happy and contented and full of thanksgiving. Full of thanksgiving. Something I once knew I could never be without drinking. I, you know, I just have always loved this story. And maybe because it, it, if you look on the right side, it says, we AAs surrender to win. We give away to keep. We suffer to get well. <clears throat> and we die to live. Beautiful. And this is in the section they stopped in time, okay? In the second edition, these are the stories. <clears throat> Rum Radio Rebellion, Fear of Fear, The Professor and the Paradox, The Flower of the Self, Unto the Second Generation, His Conscience, The Housewife Who Drank at Home, <laughs> Might Have Been Worse, Physician Heal Thyself, Stars Don't Fall, Me, an Alcoholic, New Vision for a Sculpture. If you have not taken the time to read the stories from the second edition, I think you'll enjoy them. Win Laws, Freedom from Bondage. She spoke at the 1955 International Convention, and we have her talk on recovery speakers. If you haven't heard it, you'll want to. We're going to play a little clip of the, uh, I thought we were, but maybe we're not. I'm going to play a clip of it one way or another. But when law is freedom from bondage. So uh, she got sober in 1947 at age 33. She wrote her story at eight years sober. The new appendices in the book, We've already covered the AA tradition, spiritual experience, medical view on AA, the Lasker Award, the religious view on AA, and how to get in touch with AA. I got to tell you, looking at this book, they just didn't leave anything out. 
This was a 1955 July issue of the Grapevine. And the Grapevine featured a review of the second edition big book that was released the same month as the Grapevine. The Saturday Review did one of only a few of the reviews that were done on the second edition. A lot of the company publishers and people that normally would do book reviews didn't book review it because the book had been out since 1939. But with all of the additions and changes to the book, all of the stories and, the, and things that they added in, we were fortunate enough to get some great book reviews of the second edition. Second edition was done between 1955 and 1974. There were 16 different printings. As you already know, there were the first printing, there were two different runs of the first printing before they came out with a second printing. And people will often ask, you know, how do you tell the difference between the printings? Just wanna show you that the first one was done uh, been available in July of 55. In May of 57, they did the second printing. It's unstated. And in the book, you can tell that it's a second printing because on page XX of the, in the very beginning, um, they have seven lines down. The word really is spelled correctly. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how I ended up there. Tim, help. All right, hang on, guys. Give me one second, because I will find where I am. I went too fast. All right, yeah, here yeah. I am. So what I'm going to do is share with this uh, Win Laws from her recording at the 1955 International. We learn in Alcoholics oh, and Women's group to eliminate. We have a custom in my part of the country that I like very much. And I'm going to ask another favor of all you this afternoon. When I say hi to you, will you say hi when back to me? Hi, everybody. You see, this has a great deal of meaning for me, not only because we do it in California, but it seems to me that I'm rather completing a circle in some way. For I'm a Missourian, and I graduated from St. Elizabeth Academy in St. Louis. So I come home another way. I'm one of those who very seriously believes that alcoholism is a sickness. And I stand before you convinced that my drinking was but a symptom of my sickness. I believe that the drinking was a symptom the bottle symbol, like the book says. Because I know that all my life, I thought like a practicing alcoholic long before I ever took a drink of anything with alcohol in it. For I am an out and out neurotic. I started drinking when I was 23 years old, and it seems to me on reflection that I deliberately turned to alcohol at that time. I felt very superior to people who drank up to then, and I feel now that I had avoided it because of the fear of it, for I come from a long line of alcoholic and neurotic people, and I've seen what alcohol could do to people that I had known, how their personalities would change and how they would become people that I didn't know at all. And then I'm sure, too, that my egocentricity had something to do with this, 
Because, you see, I didn't want to ever lose command of the situation. And I was afraid that alcohol would make it impossible for me to run the lives of everybody around me and have utter and complete control of every given situation. And I didn't want that to happen. But I turned to it. Because I couldn't go on living sober any longer. Because 23, I was just as sick and just as desperate as I was at 33 and a half when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. But at 23, I had no place to go with my sickness. And that was when laws. Uh, okay, so I started to cover this and then my screen got screwed up. These are the, the appendices that they added. All right, so now I'm going to talk about, and I already did, but I'm going to show you this you know, briefly, the first issue, first printing, had the white band and it had the third paragraph on the inside of the back flap of the dust jacket. It was published by, so all of the first editions from, from uh, the first printing of 1939 through the 14th printing of the first edition were all printed by Works Publishing. And then the 15th printing, they changed the name from Works Publishing to a a pub i'm trying to pull one so i can i wanted to make sure that the 15th printing came out in, in 1954 the last printing of the first edition was in august of 54 that was a 16th printing and they didn't plan on printing 16. They planned on printing 15, but they had sold out. So they printed the 16th, knowing that they were coming out with the second edition in, uh, in July of this year. So when we look at the, uh, we don't have the printings of the first edition there. Anyway, the, so the 16th printing of the first edition, they did less than uh, less, less printings, less copies printed than they did of the 13th, 14th, or 15th. So the 16th printing of the first edition is a little bit uh, difficult to find. So this was uh, where Tim has the red box. That shows that it can be uh, <clears throat> examined and returned if you're not happy. Now, the first printing that came out in 1955, this was what was sold through the mail and at the groups and at the local um, bookstores and at the clubhouses. And in here, it's unstated. So you see second edition down here, a new and revised 1955, and you don't see any printings. If you turn to page 16 and look at the bottom, uh, you'll see that 1955, it shows AA is now comprised of nearly 6,000 groups, and it's got 1955. Well, that tells us that this is either a first or second printing. And if you go above to the forward, and you go to page XX, and you go seven lines down, you look at the word really, where it says really tried, the word really is misspelled. So if you happen to come across a second edition that's unstated, that has... <coughs> On page 16, 6,000 groups, and on page XX, the word really with only one L, you do in fact have a, for a true first printing of the second edition. The second printing is exactly the same as their first printing. The only difference is they changed the word and spelled really correctly. Everything else is identical. Now the third printing, this is crazy. The third printing of the second edition 
It's wild. Because not only did they mess it up, they really messed it up. The front of the jacket says this is the third edition of the big book, new and revised, the basic text for alcoholics and others. Well, it's not the third edition. It's the second edition. Okay. What else did they screw up? They screwed up that it was inside the flap of the dust jacket. It says third edition, 1959. Then on page 16 down at the bottom, it shows that AA had grown by four or by 1,000 groups from 1955 to 1959. So in four years, we went from almost 6,000 groups to some 7,000 groups. So if you have a unstated second edition that has 7,000 groups listed at the bottom of page 16 and the air dust jacket, you've got something great. If you have it without a dust jacket, it's still cool, but you can't find any of the of the changes like where it says third edition. So uh, then the next thing that happened was AA changed its name 1960 from AA Publishing to Alcoholics Anonymous World Service, which is what they continue to do today. And uh, the second edition uh, continued to be published until uh, the mid seventies. After sixteen printings, they uh, they were able to come out with a third edition.